Welcome to all of you as we gather this day in our Lord's name to hear his word and to sing to him our uh, hymns and lift up our voices in prayer. The theme that ties together all of today's readings is one of great warning. We're taking a look at uh, how bad things got in the Old Testament in our first lesson. And Jesus shares a parable today about how he was rejected by the Jews. But then, because of the grace of God, the non-Jewish world was brought into the family of faith. Today I want to take this opportunity to do a special sermon. Uh, you might recall, I've done this a few times in the past, where I take a select hymn. And we use that as the basis for the sermon, looking at its history, looking at its theological message. You know, one of the great treasures that you and I have is the hymnal, and that's such a beautiful prayer book. And when you know the background of some of these hymns, it changes forever in a good way uh, how you sing them in the future. Our order of service today is largely the common service, but we are going to begin with the gathering rite of the word. And again, my sermon is based on uh, that special Lutheran hymn, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. So with those things in mind, may you please stand as we begin today's service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Said Jesus at your word, we are gathered all to hear you. Let our hearts and souls be stirred now to seek and love and fear you. By your teaching sweet and holy, drawn from earth to love you solely. on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers. How sweet are your words to my taste. Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Yet so often we have despised God's word and failed to gladly hear and learn it. For this and all our sins, we bow before God and humbly ask his forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins 
and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God gave his word so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The scriptures testify about Jesus, who lived a perfect life for you, died on the cross to pay for all your sins, and rose again to assure you of your salvation. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your bountiful goodness, keep us safe from every evil of body and soul. Make us ready with cheerful hearts to do whatever pleases you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first reading comes from 2 Kings. It's rather hard for us to imagine, but there were times in the Old Testament where God's people had kings so evil that they did satanic worship even in the midst of the temple of God. Our first reading is from 2 Kings chapter 21. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the disgusting practices of the nations, which the Lord had driven out before the people of Israel. He rebuilt the high places, which his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, just as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. He bowed down to the whole army of the heavens, and he served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord, about which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. He built altars to all the army of the heavens in the two courtyards of the house of the Lord. He made his son pass through the fire. He practiced fortune-telling and sought omens and dealt with mediums and spiritists. He greatly increased the evil he did in the eyes of the Lord and provoked him to anger. He put an image of Asherah, which he had made, into the house, about which the Lord said to David and his son Solomon, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. I will not make the feet of Israel wander again from the land which I gave to their fathers. If they will, just be careful to do whatever I commanded them, and to observe the whole law which my servant Moses commanded them. But they did not listen. 
Manasseh led them astray so that they did more evil than the nations whom the Lord exterminated before the people of Israel. Then the Lord said through his prophets, Disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of all who hear of it will tingle. I will stretch out over Israel the plumb line that was stretched out over Samaria and the level used on which the house of Ahab. I will wipe away Jerusalem just as someone wipes a bowl clean and turns it upside down. I will hand over the remnant of my possession and give them into the hand of their enemies so that they become plunder and spoils for all their enemies. Because they have done what is evil in my eyes and have provoked me to anger from the day when their fathers came out of Egypt until today. This is the word of the Lord. We continue with Psalm 118. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. As fellow workers, we also urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, at a favorable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. Look, now is the favorable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are giving no one a reason to stumble in any way, so that our ministry will not be blamed. Rather, in every way we show ourselves to be God's ministers, 
in great endurance, in troubles, in hardships, in difficulties, in beatings, in imprisonments, in riots, in hard work, in sleepless nights, in times of hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in sincere love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness on the right and on the left, through the glory and dishonor, through bad report and good report, treated as deceivers, yet being honest, treated as unknown and yet being well known, as dying and yet look, we live, as punished yet not put to death, as grieving yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken to you openly, Corinthians. Our heart is standing wide open. We have plenty of room for you, but you do not have room for us in your affections. I am speaking as to my children. In exchange, open your hearts wide too. This is the word of the Lord. Today's verse of the day is Hebrews 2.12. Alleluia. I will proclaim your name to my people. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Alleluia. May you please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory be to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. He leased it out to some tenant farmers and went away on a journey. When the time approached to harvest the fruit, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. The, tenants, the tenant farmers seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then the landowner sent even more servants than the first time. The tenant farmers treated them the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. They took him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. So when the landowner comes, what will he do to those tenant farmers? They told him, He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. Then he will lease out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his first fruit when it is due. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. That is why I tell you the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces its fruit. This is the gospel of our Lord. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So today I want to take a look at this beautiful hymn, one that undoubtedly many of us have sung innumerable times throughout our lifetimes. Uh, obviously we sing it an awful lot during the month of October. That's the time when we celebrate the Reformation. And this is, of course, one of the great Reformation hymns. Right next to A Mighty Fortress Is Our God. It's this hymn today, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word, that is 
one of Luther's most influential. But unlike a mighty fortress is our God, this one actually has a lot of controversy surrounding it uh, in Luther's own day. When we take a look at the events surrounding the writing of this hymn, it really is something that is just absolutely amazing, and it's something for us to be so grateful about that this is a part of our Lutheran heritage. We know pretty exactly the time and the exact circumstances surrounding Martin Luther when he wrote this hymn. The year was 1541, and Europe was on the precipice of completely getting overrun by foreign armies. The Muslim nations were invading Europe from the uh, southeast, from the land of Turkey, and pushing towards into the heart of Europe. And I know it might be a little bit hard to see here, but this is a map that shows the areas that we're talking about. In the upper left-hand area, you'll see that little red dot. And that is Wittenberg, so that's where the Reformation took place, that's where Luther was teaching and so forth. And what I did is more towards the center of the screen there, I put a red circle. That is in the nation of Hungary, and that's where Budapest, Hungary is. And so in August of 1541, the King of Austria, King Ferdinand, his armies were crushed in battle against Muslim Turks and all of Europe was teetering on being completely overrun. The main defender of Europe at this time was the Spanish King Emperor Charles V and that's the gentleman actually the Emperor that the Lutherans went to with the Augsburg Confession and Emperor Charles V his armies were waging war against the Turks but in October of that same year of 1541, his navy was destroyed by a hurricane. And things had gotten so bad that the German leader, the elector, requested prayers and prayer services to go out to lift up their voices to God for protection for their very lives. At the same time, too, things were so bad that the French were taking advantage of this entire situation, and they were actually siding with the Muslims against many of the Christians in Europe. And that is the instance, uh, the uh, circumstances surrounding Martin Luther writing this uh, hymn. He did it as a prayer, and it was actually for a special prayer service and it was first sung by the boys' choir there in Wittenberg for this special service of prayer because they were literally facing death. And these are some of the grave circumstances surrounding Luther putting these words to paper. You'll note that this year of 1541 has some significance because Martin Luther dies only five years later in 1546. And so this comes uh, near the very end of Luther's life, and it shows his mature theology. This hymn had become so popular that it was often the last hymn sung of church services, uh, and it would be followed only by the final benediction. And so it found quickly a place in Lutheran circles. Uh, it was first printed on large sheets of paper to go out quickly to the kingdom but it made its way into a Lutheran hymnal as early as 1543. Now one of the things that makes this hymn controversial was the original first stanza of the hymn. This is what actually what Luther had wrote. Luther's actual first words were, Lord, keep us steadfast in thy word and curb the Turks and Papist sword who Jesus Christ, thine only Son, fain would tumble from off thy throne. And so this is not just a hymn, of course, but this is a prayer, a prayer. A prayer of Luther, a prayer of those Lutherans, because they were actually facing their own mortality. The fact that all of Europe could be overrun. And there's an earnestness in this prayer.
And it also shows us something about the insight of Luther's mind. You know, they were all afraid of perishing at the sword. But look at Luther is also very much concerned about false theology, about deceitfulness. And it's for that reason that he talks against the Pope. Now, at the same time, Lutherans and Catholics and their lands were often engaged in wars. And so sadly, warfare and people dying for uh, religious causes were not unknown at this time. But this idea of praying against the sword and praying against false theology is something that uh, is carried on in our modern translation. This is actually what you and I do sing. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would seek to overthrow your son and to destroy what he has done. So again, in Luther's mind, false theology, robbing people of the gospel, is every bit as dangerous as facing the sword in battle. But what does Luther say? Keep, keep us steadfast in your word. You know, we do a really good job, I think, of uh, clarifying how one comes to faith, and we make a, a, a good presentation that we can never choose God of our own free thinking or our, or our own wills. But of course, we are Christians because of what God has done in the waters of baptism, in the preaching of his word. God gets all the credit for you and for me and for any Christian coming to faith. But I think one thing that we need to start preaching more on, and something that you see is how relevant, is keeping in the faith. Keeping the faith. You know, we have a once saved, always saved mentality. And sadly, Emmanuel Lutheran Church is really no different than any church that's ever existed, right? It has to face that ugly and wrong theology of once saved, always saved. There's individuals who think that, well, because their child or they themselves are baptized, that's all there needs to be done. And they don't really stay in the Word of God. There are some who rest their hopes on heaven because one day in the past they were confirmed. But it's this act of preservation that is so vital to us. The fact of the matter is, is we can choke out our faith. We can starve faith itself. And there are individuals who were once vibrant members of the Christian church, but who now have no faith at all. And so we confess this in that first article, don't we? I believe that God created me and all that exists and that he gave me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my mind and all my abilities. And I believe that God still preserves me. How important that act of preservation is, of keeping the faith, of allowing somebody to be in this world as troubled as it is, but to keep their focus on God and to keep that saving faith beating in their heart. And that, of course, is the work of God. And he does it. God does that through the word. It's no different. The same God who brings us to faith in the words of the Bible is the same one that nurtures and grows that faith in that very same word of God. You know, that's this word that is not terribly uncommon uh, or hard to understand, but it's one we really don't use a whole lot, and I'm talking about the word steadfast. Probably don't use that a whole lot in our day-to-day -day lives. And again, it's not a difficult word to understand. If something is steadfast, it means it's, it's fixed. It's established, it doesn't move, and it does not waver. And that's what Luther is really calling us to. Lord, keep us steadfast. Don't let us waver on your word. Allow us to have that bold faith in what you have said. And so what Luther is praying about is having a steadfast faith in a steadfast word. You know, God told Malachi, I, the Lord, do not change. And we do have a steadfast word, right? All those promises that your sins have been paid for, all of those promises that he who dies in Christ will be in heaven forever, 
Those come from an unchanging God, and nothing can undo those promises. Yet how often do we find ourselves in doubt? You know, we can go through trials and tribulations in this world. People, sometimes even Christians, look at all the problems going around and they kind of think, what's God doing? What's he doing? And they can even begin to doubt their own salvation or God's love for them when they face trials and tribulations in this world. And it's only through that active listening that is really a difficult thing to do that keeps us strong in God. And there's no other replacement for it. You know, Paul said this to the Christians, Therefore, my dear brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And he commands that. You know why? It's easy to lose heart. It's easy to lose your focus. It's easy to lose your mind and that mind's focus on God in this world. It isn't easy, is it? You know, my guess is that in your life, so many things have changed, obviously, this year. Uh, your shopping has changed. Maybe some of you, or most of you, would normally have taken a vacation this year, and maybe you didn't because of all the things that are going on. We socialize different. One of, my, one of the members here mentioned to me the other day that you know, they went to see their grandchild and they had to keep that six-foot distance away and it's just being precautious because of the pandemic going around. And you know, even just how we interact with family, that has changed. How we worship has changed. All these things are different. And so my question for you today is, has your intake has your level of reading God's Word, has your time in the Bible also changed? Because we live in such a crazy and turbulent time, has your intake of God's Word also gone very high because you keep needing to hear those simple truths that God so lovingly tells you? And it should change, right? We need to be more prepared today. We need to be more on guard today. We need to be more prepared to answer people's questions today. Peter reminds us, but regard the Lord, the Christ, as holy in your hearts. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that is in you. And people are searching. They're searching for something more than what politics can give, searching for more than what Hollywood can give, searching for more than what even their bank account can give. We need to be prepared to give them that solid answer of the hope that lies within us. These are some very turbulent days, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to know a little bit more about this hymn, because I knew it was written in very turbulent times. And you know, God's Word reminds us that the Christian church has always been the church militant. We have always faced problems from within as people try to distort God's truth, but also we faced persecution from without. And just look at this powerful saying in Psalm 2. This is what God reminds us. Why do the nations, plural, rage? Why do the peoples grumble in vain? The kings of the earth take a stand, and the rulers join together against the Lord and against his anointed one. You know, in Luther's day, that meant the Pope, who was saying that Jesus did not do enough on the cross to earn heaven for people. And that Pope, in Luther's mind, stood against Christ as ever powerful as the Muslims were. And today we see so, en so many enemies of the cross, don't we? People that want the church to go away, people that want the church to just be quiet. So we turn to verse 2 of this beautiful hymn. Lord Jesus Christ, your power make known, for you are Lord of lords alone. Defend your Christendom that we may sing your praise eternally. And of course, we have been in a war ever since Adam and Eve fell into sin. And I just love these words, your power make known. Lord Jesus Christ, your power make known. And I was really wrestling with these words. 
Um, certainly we know what they mean in part. In part, it's that yearning. It's that yearning as, you know, we keep fighting these battles and we keep seeing the church get shoved around. And it's that prayer, that yearning for Jesus to just come back. And don't you want to see Jesus in all of his glory? Don't you want to see forces of evil just finally be once and for all defeated? Of course you do. And we yearn for that beautiful, powerful display of Jesus when we're going to see him in all of his glory. But I think there's something a little bit more here, too. And it rather is connected to when we pray the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come. Because not only is, Lord, your power make known, I think, looking forward and yearning for Christ's second coming, but I can't help but think it also is looking backwards. That power of Jesus, that Son of God who lived that perfect life. And when we see the cross, we see victory in our eyes of faith. We know Jesus defeated sin there. We know that Jesus defeated the devil there. And isn't that the power? Isn't that the glory of God? Isn't that why we can have hearts of joy? Because the Son of God died for you. You will have everlasting life in him. And so I think that your power make known goes both ways. Yearning for Christ's second coming, but also that we make the power of Christ known as we share the word with the world around us. You know, when Luther wrote this in the original, uh, the place where it says, defend your Christendom, it has the words, poor church. And it's that idea that the church is not going to be powerful this side of heaven. It's not going to wield the sword. It's not going to have unlimited power like we see the world around us have. And our defense comes from Jesus alone. And I couldn't help but just tie it in with something I heard on the news this week where one politician just talking about the pandemic said, I don't care. I don't care about your religion. You have to follow the rules of the state. Now, I'll give people the benefit of the doubt as we go through something very difficult like this pandemic. But I am afraid of the overreach of certain powers, even in our own midst, in our nation. And we have to keep an eye on that. When we sing God's praises eternally, that's not hyperbole, is it? That's literal. Because we are going to live and reign with Jesus forever. O comforter of priceless worth, send peace and unity on earth. Support us in our final strife and lead us out of death to life. Jesus says in John 14, If you love me, hold on to my commands. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Our EHV says counselor. The ESV says helper. You might remember the King James. Remember that it's the same word that we find in our hymn, that comforter. That's the Holy Spirit. And you know, the world that I see around me is the world that is trying to get torn apart as people are divided by the color of their skin and the amount of money that is in their checkbooks, the places where they live, all of these different things, the devil comes in and he tears people apart. But how beautiful it is that that work of the Holy Spirit is to bring people together. And I look at all the years of my ministry and I see all the different people solely by the grace of God that have been brought into the Christian faith. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things I could ever see this side of heaven. People of so many different backgrounds, people who would otherwise never have any association with one another, are now together. And the thing that binds them together is that saving faith in Jesus Christ. The only hope for this world, the only peace we can have in this world, is that which comes from God himself. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. But this side of heaven, we have to keep on praying. We have to keep on fighting because we are the church militant and we're going to face those troubles every single day until Jesus returns. I want to share one last Bible quote that touches upon the very last thought of this hymn. It comes from 1 Corinthians 15. And Paul reminds us, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep, 
For as in Adam they all die, so also in Christ they will all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ as the firstfruits, and then Christ's people at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has done away with every other ruler and every other authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Death is the last enemy to be done away with. And so it is, because Jesus is victorious. Our final battle and our final strife, of course, is against death itself. When we are steadfast in God, steadfast in his word, we know we've already died. We know now we're children of God forever and ever. Today we are victorious. Today we can sing. Today we can pray. And may we do that. And may we do that boldly. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will now actually sing, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Including in today's prayers, Irvin Schmidt and Louis Poster and Dean Tesh, who are battling illness. Uh, and it'll be with uh, great joy that following today's service that uh, we'll be bringing in uh, Ed Walzak, uh, our new member today. That'll be happening uh, right after this service. And uh, congratulations to Ed and Laura, as not too long ago they were joined in holy matrimony. So let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, how many and powerful are the enemies of your word, who by stealth and at times by force would seek to overthrow your precious gospel of salvation. But we Christians in every age take comfort in your promises that your word will endure forever and that the gates of hell cannot overcome your church. Even though Satan and his wicked cohorts have always found some ready to believe error and to persecute the truth, nevertheless you have curbed their furious wrath and not permitted the overthrow of the Christian faith. For these blessings of your protecting hand, we are eternally grateful and pray this day that you may keep us steadfast in your word. May the Holy Spirit, our comforter and helper in all things, ever lead us in that which is right and true, and finally lead us out of death to life. Today we lift up to you for healing and preservation of faith those in our midst who are dealing with illness. We pray for Irvin Schmidt, Louis Poster, and Dean Tesh. We give you praise and thanks, dear Lord, that you are increasing and preserving your kingdom of saints. And we rejoice as Ed Walzak will be welcomed in as our new member this day. Continue to bless him as he has his faith in you. This day we also pray for our President Donald Trump and our Governor Tony Evers. We pray these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we sing hymn 457. May you please stand for prayer. Almighty God, grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that we may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated. Our last hymn is 346, In You Is Gladness.
reminder that, of course, this Saturday will be the LWMS rally, and so that will all be held electronically. Uh, the individual churches will all be meeting at their own church. Uh, so that will be happening here uh, Saturday at 9 a.m. I believe there's going to be some coffee and refreshments. Uh, and I don't know with any certainty, but uh, I believe the entire rally will be somewhere around two hours in length. And so uh, there are some more blue sheets on one of the round tables as you are leaving today. So God's richest blessings be upon you, and may he see you uh, to your home safely. Thank you.